This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. While in Chicago for the 2015 Fall Conference of the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts, the IRSJA, Dr. Mark Winborn agreed to sit down with me to speak about something I've been dying to clear up. What exactly is a Jungian analyst, and how is it different from a clinical psychologist? Dr. Winborn earned a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Memphis in 1987 and a diploma in analytical psychology, which is the degree of a Jungian analyst, from the IRSJA training program in 1999. He served for three years as the staff psychologist at West Point Military Academy in New York and has been in private practice in Memphis, Tennessee since 1990. Dr. Winborn is currently on the Executive Committee of the American Board for Accreditation in Psychoanalysis, as well as Chair of their Distance Learning Committee and Committee on Accreditation. He is affiliated with the National Association for the Advancement of Psychoanalysis and the International Association for Analytical Psychology. He is a training and supervising analyst of the IRSJA and the training coordinator for the Memphis Atlanta Jungian Seminar. Dr. Winborn is a visiting faculty member at various Jung institutes and centers throughout the United States, as well as at the C.G. Jung Institute in Zurich. He is the author of Deep Blues, Human Soundscapes for the Archetypal Journey, published in 2011, and the editor of the book Shared Realities, Participation, Mystique, and Beyond, published in 2014. Thanks, Mark, for agreeing to answer some of these questions today. You're welcome, Laura. So you have a doctor of philosophy in clinical psychology, but then you went on to become a Jungian analyst. So could you explain to us what that process involved? Sure. Um, the PhD in clinical psychology is four years of coursework and practical experience in various clinical settings, as well as research and design of research projects. So it falls out under what's called the scientist practitioner model. So we're trying to integrate science and practice. Mm-hmm. And then um, there's a one-year full-time internship that you have to go on where you're full-time as a clinician before you actually receive your Ph.D. So it's a five-year program. Okay. After that, uh, I was a psychologist in the Army on active duty for four years. And during that time, was able to start studying at the New York Jung Foundation and get into my first analysis. Mm-hmm. And then after separating from the Army, I came to Memphis, Tennessee, where they have one of the seminars for the uh, Interregional Society and became an auditor, uh, enrolled as a student in that seminar, and then eventually applied for candidacy. Now, moving through trainings, through the analytic training, it really depends on the student. Uh, It can take the, the shortest you can go through is four years. And some people have taken 13 years, and it just depends on your pace, how you're able to assimilate the material, and to a certain extent, the promptings of the self from within, of how quickly you need to move through. For me, it took five years. Okay, so you got your PhD, and then you decided to go further. Would you you describe it as further? Yeah, actually, a good analogy for this is medical training. Okay. So you go through medical school for four years, and you're an MD. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the basic level. And an MD can go out and practice uh, with that level of uh, specialization, but it's a very generalized practice. Okay. Then let's say they go to their residency, and let's say somebody goes to a surgical residency. Well, that adds another layer of specialization Mm -hmm. onto their original medical training. And then let's say somebody decides they want to become a neurosurgeon. Well, then they have to go back and do a specialized residency in neurosurgery on top of their surgery residency. So all analysts come from some sort of background. For the most part, although there are some exceptions, we come from schools of social work, psychiatry, psychology, uh, chaplaincy, Mm -hmm things like that, uh, pastoral counselors. 
And so we all come from these diverse backgrounds. And in the analytic field, all of those backgrounds are equal. Once you're a candidate in an analytic training program, essentially nobody cares what your, not, it's not that nobody cares, but right. it's no longer very relevant because you're, you've got your basic fundamental um, mental health skills, mm-hmm. and then you're acquiring these additional skills of, a psych, of, a, of an analytic perspective that are added on to that. And so it is a, it's a specialized form of treatment uh, that is, I think, uniquely different than any other form of right. uh, treatment. Now, during that time, um, what happens is you take another, you take a series of about 400 hours of coursework. And during that time, you're also still undergoing your personal analysis to deal with your own issues and to understand your own psyche. And then, and then you're also going through supervision of your cases. So it's called a tripartite model where the didactic coursework, personal analysis, and the supervision of your coursework by other analysts form the three legs of this training in any psychoanalytic orientation, whether it's Jungian or schools that have derived from the Freudian tradition. They all rely on these same three legs. When you were practicing clinical psychologist, how was how you treated your clients different from now being a union analyst, how you treat your clients? Well, it's very different. I mean, I was trained in my doctoral program primarily in cognitive behavioral therapy and family systems therapy, which uh, deal with the mind in a very different way, and I distinguish mind from psyche. So with cognitive behavioral therapy, in my opinion, Mm -hmm. it's a a therapy based on repression. You have irrational thoughts that you're supposed to confront as a means of getting them out of your mind. Mm -hmm. And so from a psychoanalytic perspective, that's that's called the defense of repression, or if it's a more conscious effort, suppression. Mm -hmm. And so, to me, it, it's a very restrictive thing that doesn't open up one's experience of oneself in the world. It actually closes it down. Now, it may reduce some of the person's distress, mm-hmm. but it hasn't actually resolved any of the issues that bring these negative or irrational thoughts to mind in the first place. So, cognitive behavioral therapy is the most popular therapy in the world because it's actively promoted Mm -hmm. by insurance companies, because it's cheaper. Because the training for a practitioner is less? Is that why it's cheaper? Well, it's less because uh, it's geared towards a shorter, it's a shorter term form of therapy. And I, I won't bore you with all of the statistics about the difference between effectiveness of cognitive behavioral therapy and analytically oriented therapy. Well, like I'll try to summarize it as briefly as possible. Uh, But in many, many studies of cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, in Sweden, the government invested 1 billion Swedish crowns, which is equivalent to 500 billion U.S. dollars, to try to implement cognitive behavioral therapy countrywide because they wanted it to be a cost-effective treatment. So every country, every uh, pro treatment program sponsored by the government became cognitive behavioral therapy, and they did this from 2008 to 2012 invested 1 billion Swedish crowns in the program, and then they studied the effectiveness of the program. They enlisted a a research firm to study how well it worked, and the research firm's conclusion was it had no long-term beneficial effect on the patients who received treatment. Now, what happens is immediately the conclusion of therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, looks pretty good. But four months after treatment, most people have relapsed to their original level of functioning within four months. 
Now, what happens if you study that with psychoanalytic, analytically oriented therapies is not only is the treatment effect, this, the, the effectiveness of the treatment larger at the end of the treatment, but the treatment effect, how well the person's functioning, mm-hmm. how, how much less distress they experience in their lives, how much they perceive themselves as understanding themselves better, all sorts of different factors. Those actually continue to grow, and the longest they've studied them is six years. Mm-hmm. But the treatment effect, even after treatment has ended, continues to grow over time. But that stuff doesn't get reported in the popular press very often. And that's part of what I'll be speaking on uh, this weekend to the union, so that they have, uh, even a lot of unions aren't familiar with this research, Mm -hmm. and that's part of what I'm bringing this weekend is the information about these studies so that uh, unions themselves can be effective advocates for their own uh, preferred method of treatment. And I appreciate you sharing that with us. So when you use the word psychoanalysis Mm -hmm. or psychoanalytic, what does that mean? Well, all psychoanalytic, uh, analytically oriented forms of therapy, whether they emerge from Freud's model, Mm -hmm. which has become much more diverse. There's not a, just as there's not a single form of Jungian analysis, there's certainly not a single form of Freudian analysis. Now, Mm -hmm. I prefer to refer to them as contemporary psychoanalytic models. And uh, so all models of analytic therapy, Jungian or Freudian, believe in that we are influenced by unconscious motivators and influences. Okay? So that's the first commonality across all of these. So that if most people think they're the master of their own house, that what goes on in their mind is determined by their conscious thoughts, and it's just not true. And this is being borne out time and again by contemporary neuroscience, for example. Mm. The majority of our mental activity is unconscious. We are processing so much stuff on an unconscious level that we never become conscious of. But what psychoanalysis does is geared towards, and I'm including Jungian analysis under psychoanalysis okay. here specifically. I'm using it as a more generic term. Mm-hmm. But what it does is it focuses our attention on the things that give us clues about what's going on with those unconscious motivators. And so things like dreams, things like fantasies, things like slips of the tongue. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's very nuanced, subtle things like the shift in somebody's breathing when they begin talking about something. Sometimes it's a shift in posture. Sometimes it's a session that they forgot. But there's all sorts of clues about what's happening with somebody's unconscious world that then the psychoanalytic method is geared towards kind of focusing in and saying, stop, let's take a little look at that. And dreams are certainly a commonality amongst all analytic therapies, that dreams are looked to as a particular source of information Mm -hmm. that's outside the conscious perspective. If two people are sitting in a room and they're only dealing with what's conscious, not much is going to happen. Then the third thing I'd say that all analytic therapies emphasize is the importance of the relationship between the patient or client, whichever you prefer to talk about. Sometimes more formally, we talk about it as an analysand and the analyst. That comes out in the form of what we call transference and countertransference. And that sounds kind of stuffy and off-putting, but what they're really talking about is that we walk through life trying to finish unfinished business. Mm -hmm. And we play that out in relationships. We've got a little drama going on in us, a little play. There's a little stage, Mm -hmm. and there's action going on on that stage. And we pull people in from our lives and make them participants in our drama. And so that's what the, the, the analyst is doing, is trying to understand how is the person relating to me, how am I relating to them, and what does that tell us about what's going on in my unconscious and in the patient's unconscious. So I'd say those three things, the belief in unconscious motivators, and it's really not a belief in my opinion, mm-hmm. I think it's adequately doc- documented yeah. at this point. 
and the utilization of dreams as a primary avenue into the unconscious, as well as the transference, counter-transference relationship, or you could just say the therapeutic relationship. Mm -hmm. And most therapies that are not analytic are not closely paying attention and tracking the analytic relationship as a part of the process of transformation. Something that my analyst told me early on is she would say real change occurs at depth. What is in the popular culture, Oprah, Dr. Phil, it's this quick fix. People's problems are resolved at the end of the hour. And what was pointed out to me was, well, where are those people six months from now, a year from now? Mm -hmm. And like you used the word relapse a little while ago. Just like people can relapse with an addiction, we can relapse with our behavior as well. You're and right. revert back to old patterns. Yeah, and, and that's a better word for it, old patterns. Uh, you know, we've got all sorts of patterns that we carry around with us. Some are effective for us, and others are not so effective for us. Mm -hmm. Some carry us forward, and some don't. And so to, that's one of the distinctions... Uh, there are some distinctions between Jungian analysis and other psychoanalytic schools that I think were more prominent at one time, but I think they've come closer to each other. Mm -hmm. Jungians have come a little bit closer to the psychoanalytic models and incorporated some of those ideas. And likewise, some of the, the issues that are important to Jungian analysts have also become more important to uh, contemporary psychoanalytic practices. And I'd like to just highlight briefly two of those. Yes, please. One of those is the notion that we're moving, we're not just trying to resolve things from the past, we're also trying to have a sense of where we're moving towards. Yes. So there is, there, there's a forward looking to that's very prominent in Jungian analysis right. that hasn't been as prominent in contemporary psychoanalytic theories, but it is coming into focus now for them as well. I don't know if it will ever become as important to those schools of thought as it is in Jungian analysis, but I feel a lot more kinship now than I, I did at one point. Oh, the other thing, and this relates to the same thing, is the, the notion of the transpersonal, whether you call that a religious experience, mm -hmm. whether you call that the Godhead, whether you call it the divine, or whether you just call it opening up to something larger than yourself. And the transpersonal, or the tra Jung uses the word transcendent, mm -hmm. is another way of referring to this. That transcendent element is very prominent in the Jungian world. And so we're always looking for not just where has this patient been, mm -hmm. what are the old patterns that need to get re-established in a new way, but we're also saying, where is this person going? And trying to intuit that uh, from the dreams, uh, from the interactions. Uh. I think it's really interesting that when you pointed out about the client or the patient's relationship with their therapist and how important that really is. I had a friend of mine a number of years ago asked me, he said, well, what's the difference between when you talk to your analyst or when you talk to me every day? Well, for one thing, whether you believe it or not, as close as a friend may be, you still have concerns about how they perceive you. And same thing with your spouse. So there's a degree in which uh, there's a very intimate relationship that goes on with an analyst. Mm -hmm. If it's done well, it can obviously uh, go badly. Yes. Uh, but if it's done well, there's a great deal of intimacy. But there's also in, a way in which the analyst is separate enough from your life, mm -hmm. uh, and you know less about the analyst than you know about your friend and your spouse and your significant other, whomever you, we're talking about. Right that some of that concern about how does this person see me and how do I need them to see me, want them to see me, comes into play less with an analyst. Mm -hmm. Now, you could say that's, that's the same as for any uh, therapeutic relationship, actually. That's a, a universal factor of a therapeutic relationship is that very thing is it's sometimes easier to tell secrets to somebody you don't know as well 
as to somebody you know very well because there's shame, there's guilt involved. Uh, and so the therapeutic relationship is different in that uh, there's a degree of vulnerability, a, de a degree of, you could say, emotional nakedness mm -hmm. that occurs in the analytic relationship simply because each time you have a hesitation in your voice, your analyst is listening and wondering what that hesitation is about. And you might not step into that moment, but your analyst might and say, I noted a little hesitation in your voice. Is there some feeling of reluctance about speaking about the thing that was in your mind just now? Mm -hmm. And while you might have let that moment pass and closed down that window, the attentive analyst is listening closely for those and sees their role as helping you go deeper into whatever feeling it was and into the feeling of hesitation or ambivalence mm -hmm. that you had about entering into that moment. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes the analytic relationship so different. The other thing is the analyst is in some way, rather than trying to protect themselves in the moment, is they're trying to open themselves up to whatever's going on. If you're angry mm -hmm. at them, they're trying to open up that anger yeah. rather than become defensive and try to close it down. Right. Or likewise, if you're having strong feelings of affection or even erotic feelings about the analyst that you might otherwise feel like, oh, that's inappropriate to say, mm -hmm. A closely attentive analyst is trying to sense that and help you talk about that, not because they want to encourage some sort of erotic tryst going on, mm -hmm. but because even those erotic feelings are important to understanding what's going on inside and for your own understanding of how you work, how you operate. So I think that's the, that's the big difference is it's all focused on going deeper and bringing things out and many, many wonderful relationships that are important and necessary for your life are not geared that way. Right. Because that would be, on some level, that would be really weird if we went around talking at that kind of depth all of the time. That would be too much. We'd get overwhelmed with it. How does one know... I'm going to be comfortable with this person long term because analysis is long. It's a long process. And I've also heard people hesitate. I, I don't know how to find someone mm -hmm. or uh, I don't like him or I don't like her or I don't know if this person's right for me. I found my analyst kind of by accident. She was in the same office as a practitioner that I was seeing for body work. And when our body work series was over, I wanted to keep going because a lot of things had opened up for me. And she said that, well, there's a woman in my office that's in training to be a an analyst and you might want to talk to her. And that was, like I told you, a 17-year relationship. Mm -hmm. So how does one find the appropriate analyst for them? Well, that, that's the $64 billion question. Is that right? Uh, you know, there's a number of ways. I'd, I'd, I'd say your experience with your analyst is what unions would call a synchronicity, mm -hmm. that there was something meaningful in terms of the energy field going on that you happened to, a non-union would call that a coincidence, right. meaning that there's no meaning behind it, just two events ha happening simultaneously and you just got lucky. A Jungian would say there's an unconscious energy constellated there that didn't cause you to find her, but that there was meaning in finding her. As far as a more pragmatic way, because we can't all wait around for synchronicities to happen all right. of the time as much as we might like to, is that... I think a personal referral is mm -hmm. probably the best referral. Asking around, who do you see? Uh, or calling somebody that you know has some knowledge of who's around in the field. Uh, and going and having a trial and tell the analyst on the front end, this is a trial session for me. Or this is 
three trial sessions right. because I don't know that you can make that kind of determination uh, so soon. So soon. And, and that's really the way to go about it is to trust some sort of feeling and whether you feel moved in some way in those first session or sessions. Mm -hmm. And if, it's, if you're not feeling something going on on an emotional level, there's probably not a lot of juice there for you. Okay. And not every analytic relationship can be a good one because you come in with a particular psyche, I have a particular psyche, I have a particular style, right. and what you need may not mesh well with who I am and what I provide. And so in that case, would you recommend that the analysand look elsewhere, refer them? Well, I'll give you a, an easy example. Okay. It's easy for everybody to understand. If I, I, I live in Memphis, Tennessee, mm -hmm. and so that's a there's a great deal of fundamentalist or evangelical Christian community there. And so there's a lot of people that are in Memphis that want a, quote, Christian counselor. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody comes in and saying, well, I want somebody to provide Christian counseling to me, I'm, I'm very upfront and I say, I'm sorry, that's not what I do. Okay. Uh, and if you want somebody to do that, you need to look elsewhere right. because I'm not going to be comfortable and you're not going to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, if I have a strong feeling that I, that there's not a personality mesh, I might indeed tell them that at this point, essentially saying, I'm not feeling it. Okay. You know, in, in different words, but essentially, right. I'm not sensing that I can form a relationship with you. Now, that doesn't happen very often. Uh, and then I'm doing an assessment while they're doing an assessment of me, even though they, they may not even think about doing an assessment. And so I'm trying to get a sense of where they are psychologically. And often, more often than not, during the first session, I'll offer what's called an interpretation. And I'll be listening. In other words, I'll give them some small bit. What an interpretation is, is a statement about how I understand something about you and how it connects to your emotional life that I'm assuming you may not have a full understanding of. And so this is called a trial interpretation. And so what I'm doing is offering this to see how you respond to it. And so I'm, I'm evaluating you at the same time. And if somebody has a very strong negative reaction to it, uh, that's probably not a sign that they're a good candidate for the type of work that I do, which is predicated on being able to be open. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody comes open, but if they can tolerate the interpretation, which is really a confrontation of their unconscious, yes. uh, then I know that, okay, there's probably something that we can do here. Anybody following me on Twitter knows that I love books. And I started about five years ago, I started my Twitter account to quote from the books I was reading. Mm -hmm. I had somebody recently on Twitter ask me a question. She's reading books written by Jung or Jungian analysts, but she's not in analysis. And I encouraged her to seek that out. And she said, well, I can't afford it. And I said, well, first of all, there are analysts and clinics out there that offer sliding scale fees. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the relationship with the analyst is very important because we, as much as I love reading books, one of the purposes of this podcast is to talk to the people that have written these books, to talk mm -hmm. about what Jungian analysis is, and to kind of humanize the people that have written these books. So what would you say about people that read Jung but don't necessarily have that active analysis where they are working with someone on their own personal confrontation with their unconscious? If you're just reading versus if you're actively working with an analyst. Well, we heal where we are relational beings. Mm -hmm. Human beings are relational, as are most other uh, mammals, for example. 
we heal through relationships. And we also expand, not Mm -hmm. just heal, but we expand through relationships. And so the ideas maybe that are in the books may be moving to us. Uh, They're still moving to me. But it's you, you, there, I don't believe that there can be actual transformation through reading alone. And you can look at the lives of uh, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, because they didn't have analysts. <laughs> right. Freud invented psychoanalysis, <laughs> and he was his own analyst, and there's only so much you can do on your own. As brilliant as he was, you can't analyze yourself. And Carl Jung was the same way. Mm -hmm. He had, you could say, some therapeutic interactions with Freud, but he wasn't actually in analysis with Freud. He also did his own analysis, largely through his imaginative work around the Red Book. And they both did amazing jobs of getting insights into their own psyche and into the generating universal concepts Mm -hmm. that other people could utilize. But they had their own blind spots, as we all do, and there was only so far their self-analysis could take them. Uh, And that's why a personal analysis is a requirement for everybody in training. I went through nine years and, you know, sometimes twice a week. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, you're talking about your training to become a Jungian analyst. analyst. right? But not your training to become a clinical psychologist. Right. It was not required. And, in fact, in the program I went through, my, my sense that it was actively discouraged. Discouraged. Right. And well, I have, Why would that be? Because of the way the, the mind and the psyche is viewed if you come from one of these other perspectives that the the analytic relationship is not central to the process of therapy and that self-understanding is not part of it because in a sense it's you know the extreme in extreme behaviorism there is no unconscious it's a black box wow and so the influence on who the therapist is in these other schools of thought there there are others that take the relationship as important, for example, the humanistic traditions, mm-hmm. uh, existential uh, psychology does. I'm not saying that psycho- the psychoanalytic perspective is the only one that does this. Certainly there are others. But in things like cognitive behavioral therapy, who the therapist is shouldn't be very important mm-hmm. to the model. And that it's a, tech, it's, a, mm-hmm. it's a series of techniques that you apply... <laughs> And if you apply those well, things change. But in in that model, the the change doesn't come about through the work of the relationship. So who's out there prescribing all these medications? Well, I mean, the only people that can prescribe medications are physicians and nurse practitioners. Uh, So when you say physicians, you mean psychiatrists? No, no. No. I mean, 80% of antidepressants in the United States are prescribed by primary care physicians, family practice people, internal medicine people. That's what I'm seeing, for the most part, people turning to, to deal with their issues. Mm -hmm. What's your stance on that? Well, my stance is that medications help a lot of people. Uh, And... Different classes of medications do different things. Okay. Now, what we want is for the medications to help the person function effectively in therapy. We know from uh, ongoing studies that people that are just getting talk therapy improve. People that are getting medications improve if we if we rank improvement based on removal of symptoms, okay? Okay. Less depressed mood. Well, antidepressants can do that for a period of time. Uh, but they, over time, they're finding now there's this, this new research that's come out. There's uh, just like there's, uh, there, there's a condition for schizophrenics 
who are taking antipsychotic medications called tardive dyskinesia, where they build up these neurological symptoms associated with the medications they're on. Now, some of the more recent research is indicating that people who are on antidepressants uh, actually become, their system becomes resistant over a long period of time, and you can actually get this additional form of chronic depression that's a result of the medications. Now, this research is only uh, a few months old in terms of the studies that are being released, but that's where it seems to be going. Just this past week, there was a new study released on the treatment of how people with schizophrenia are treated. And for many, many decades now, the primary mode of intervention with schizophrenics was thought to be medication only, which is antipsychotics, which have a tremendous number of side effects, even though they've improved. And this new landmark study that involved something like 50 community mental health centers around the country. It's a huge study involving a huge number of people. Clearly demonstrated that, number one, you have to begin treating somebody with schizophrenia effectively within the first 72 months if they're going to have a good outcome. And rather than having a large amount of medication, antipsychotic medication, Mm -hmm. they found that actually the most effective treatment model was if they gave them a very small amount of antipsychotic medication to help them control the most extreme symptoms, which are delusions Mm -hmm. uh, and hallucinations, getting them into talk therapy and activating whatever family support or community support is available. And it was the people that were on the lowest doses of the medication that actually had the best prognosis in combination with talk therapy and this family support. Interesting. And that just came out this week. Uh, and that's something that most cl- a lot of clinicians who are psychoanalytically oriented have known for a long time. Oh, really? But we didn't know it in the, in the way we knew it anecdotally yeah. from our own practices and the practices of, of others. But you can't set a standard of care based on anecdotal evidence. But this provides a way of setting a standard of care for schizophrenia that's completely different now. So all medications, in my mind, fall into a, an analogy that I use about climbing a mountain. Dealing with any emotional issue is like climbing a mountain. Okay. And often it's difficult, whether it's depression, anxiety, Uh, psychotic symptoms like uh, hallucinations, it's a difficult process for most people. There are times along the way that people can do the therapy without medication. And then there are other times where if they don't have the medication, they're going to be too anxious to leave the house. They're going to be too depressed to get out of bed and take a shower and get to the office. So for those people, they often need assistance from the medications to keep a foothold on this climb. And that's what the medications do. They're not a cure. They are addressing particular classes of symptoms, and they are intervening at the symptom level. But in terms of the overall person, they are not transforming anything. They are helping people manage symptoms, and in that regard, they're a good tool. Sometimes. So I, I think it's an ethical choice for each individual, and I don't typically do not try to push somebody in one direction or another. If I see somebody really struggling mm-hmm. uh, and their symptoms are getting in the way of living their life and participating in their therapy, I might say, you might want to consider an antidepressant at this time, or you might want to consider, it seems like your panic attacks are something you can no longer uh, cope with any, that they're interfering with your life too much, and perhaps this is a time where an anti-anxiety medication would be beneficial. So they're taking it and they're feeling better, but really it's only meant to work short term. So what happens after six months or a year or two years when they've been taking it, it's made them feel better, they think everything's great, but whatever issue was there that was at the, the root of the depression or the anxiety has still not been dealt with. Right. So after those, let's say, two years, then what? 
Well, uh, so the, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but say because I've heard this too. My medication has stopped working. My doctor's going to change medications. I'm going to start taking something else. And sometimes that's a viable approach and a useful approach. But the 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 the, the prescribing physicians and nurse practitioners that I know that are effective Mm -hmm. are the ones that will periodically recommend to their patient, let's take a drug holiday and say they'll help them titrate off the medication and say, let's see what happens. And there shouldn't be any reason not to do that unless somebody is so suicidal that they become, uh, incredibly suicidal in their behavior immediately after stopping the medications, there's no real reason not to do that periodically, whether that's once a year, whether that's every other year of taking a month where you get all of the medications out of your system and you see where your system is. And sometimes there's changes going on that you can't tell are going on because of the medications. But what you, once you come off the medications, it's easier to tell. You, you may not be in a state where you need a medication any longer. But until you go off of the medication, it's difficult to know that. So it could be the case that someone has started taking medication to, so that they can manage their lives and deal with the symptoms. Mm-hmm. But whatever was causing the depression has still not been dealt with. Well, the body is a homeostatic, uh, self-regulating system Mm -hmm. of which the psyche is a part of. Mm -hmm. And so there are changes going on in your body, in your brain, Mm -hmm. that are sometimes going to regulate themselves over a period of time. Uh, and, And so, yeah, there are people that are depressed or are anxious that don't it's not absolutely essential for them to be in analysis uh, to, for that to change. Uh, But there, because there are neurochemical things going on, neurological things going on all of the time. And analysis is just one way of addressing that. Well, that's a good point. So then who would you say, or what would you say would be the reason to enter into Jungian analysis? Well, most people come to me, for example, already having had some experience of therapy at some point in their life, and they felt it somewhat lacking on some level. And usually that's about something like, I don't want a Band-Aid solution to this. This just keeps coming up if I don't deal with it. And these other ways of dealing with it haven't addressed what I need addressing. Uh, So that's the primary person that comes is they already have a sense that there was something missing. Mm-hmm. Now, some people read, like your your Twitter uh, mm-hmm. person who wrote in, some people have already been reading about Jung, and they feel some sense of connection yes. just on a soul level, a spiritual level with the writings of Jung. And that's how most of us find Jung, is we, we happen upon some of his writings and feel like it speaks to us, and we want to experience that more deeply. June Singer wrote a wonderful book a number of years ago called Boundaries of the Soul. And that was one of the first books I read early on. And it, I, she's just so eloquent and engaged and embodied in describing this analytic process that I thought, I want to be part of that. Yeah, I want to experience that myself. And I also want to be able to provide that experience for other people. Mm-hmm. And I don't practice now exactly the way June practiced then. Uh I have my own style that's probably very different than hers. But that was really a a way of opening me up into that that area. You just reminded me of another thing that I wanted to ask you. I heard you mention that there are three schools within Jungian psychology. Right. Three primary orientations, let's call them. Okay. Uh, So... Jung, uh, we, we now call Carl Jung and the people that followed closely after him, for example, uh, Maria Louise von Franz, mm-hmm. classical Jungians, meaning this is the central school. Around the, the 1950s, another 
prominent Jungian analyst came up in the London uh, group mm -hmm. named Michael Fordham, and he was interested in child analysis. And there weren't many Jungian analysts around that knew how to work with children. So he started reading a lot of the writings of a woman named Melanie Klein, mm -hmm. who's somebody who evolved out of the Freudian tradition. And he began to search for ways to incorporate Melanie Klein's ideas with Jungian ideas. And so this became known as, uh, it's known by different names, but let's call it the developmental school, where the, the development of the individual from birth onward is important. And he, Fordham's uh, unique contribution that in, in informs everything that hit this developmental school does is that Jung said individuation, which is the process of discovering this inner pattern and becoming most wholly yourself, mm -hmm. most fully yourself, as opposed to becoming individualistic, yes. which is a different process. Jung called this individuation, and he believed that it happened in the second half of life, after we kind of fulfilled all of our main tasks of life, getting married, if that was in the cards for us, establishing a career, having a sense of identity, uh, being a, a Chicago Bears fan, all of these things mm -hmm. he saw as first half of life things. And that in the second half of the life, you turn inward and develop a sense of what your deep inner core is trying to tell you, and finding some way of aligning your life with the agenda of that inner core. And Michael Fordham's unique contribution is he said, yes, individuation occurs, but individuation is, starts at birth and goes onward from there. And even the development of the infant uh, relationship with his mother is an individuation process. And so this is one track of these three schools, the classical and the developmental. And then around the 1960s, another Jungian analyst uh, emerged named James Hillman. Mm -hmm. And he founded what he called archetypal psychology. And he moved away from some of the primary tenets of Carl Jung mm -hmm. and formed kind of an offshoot of this. And he called this archetypal psychology, um, what, what he, he said it was focused on was that psyche is represented through images and that there isn't a central organizing self, that our psyche is a poly, what he called a polytheistic psyche. And the, the analogy he makes is there wasn't one primary god in ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. There was a multitude of gods, yeah. a pantheon of gods, and then all these other lesser gods. And he said, that's what psyche is like. There's not one central organizing force uh, laying down this, uh, this path for you. There's multiple voices all kind of vying for attention. And it's our relationship to these multiple voices that's important. And that relationship is cultivated by deepening our relationship to the images okay. that come to us, primarily through dreams, mm -hmm. but also through fantasies and things like that. So those are the three primary schools. But they all consider themselves Jungian analysts. Yes, yes, they all do. Even though they sort of differ. They and differ quite a bit. And they place different emphasis on different things. So the developmentalists place a lot of emphasis on the transference, counter-transference. Okay. The classicists place a lot of emphasis on what is the self doing? What is, how is this, can we understand what the self is doing? Uh, through dreams, for example. And then the archetypalists are placing a lot of emphasis on the images that occur to us in dreams. But we're not, the, an archetypalist wouldn't necessarily be deciphering things like, oh, that figure is your shadow, mm -hmm. and that figure is your animus, and naming them and labeling them. That's what Hellman calls a day world interpretation. And he says, I'm interested in what's going on in the underworld. He says, to put these, these psychological labels on things that are alive diminishes them. And what we want to do is open up to them and let them impact us. 
Where do you see the future of Jungian psychology headed? Well, what I hope will happen is that this kind of chasm or rift between the Jungian world and the psychoanalytic world becomes more and more filled in. Mm -hmm. And I think we as analytic clinicians have so much more in common than we have differences. And that the analytic perspective is really under attack in the popular culture and in, in, the, pre, in the economic forces that are at play, that everybody wants a cheap fix, right. a short fix. And yeah. we are about long, slow meditation, not just for the sake of long, slow meditation about psyche, but because psyche moves slowly. And we have to pace ourselves with psyche, not because we want to intentionally slow things down and lengthen things out. If somebody comes in and they have a transformative experience in 10 sessions, that's great. And they they feel like they're ready to go out. If that happens, that's wonderful. But it may take 10 years for somebody else. And they may, they may be pulling back layer after layer. That happens so frequently that people get into the analytic process and they don't even... The thing that they came in with isn't the thing that they realized at the end was the central focus anyway. So what I hope is that we get beyond some of these personalities and names. Mm -hmm. A lot of unions are not going to agree with me about this. Okay. So I'll just put that caveat on okay. there. I hope we get to a point where we appreciate the contributions of Freud, the contributions of Jung of Hillman, of Fordham, of Melanie Klein, and all these other wonderful analytic theorists and therapists, and that we focus more on the commonalities that we all share, and we're not so concerned with where the ideas came from, okay, right. but where they're going and where they carry us in the commonalities. That's where I hope, where we move a little bit away from not forget about them or their importance or their contribution, mm -hmm. but where we're not quite so attached to the person any longer. That's what I hope happens for uh, analytic therapies in general. I like that. Sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. So what's in store for you, Mark? Well, actually, I'm coming back here to Chicago in December, and I'm doing a three-day workshop for the, the Chicago Jung Institute. Uh, in November, I'll be in New York at the uh, the National Association for the Advancement of Psychoanalysis Meetings and the American Board for Accreditation in Psychoanalysis, which I'm actively involved with. The meetings occur at the same place. Um, in January, I go to Philadelphia for a three-day workshop I'm giving to that uh, seminar there. And in February, I go to Zurich to teach in the Zurich Institute, C.G. Jung Institute of uh, Zurich. Nice. So that's the next four months, but it's it's kind of uh, it's a pretty busy schedule for the next eight or nine months. Yeah, and are any of those workshops open to the public? Some of them will be. Uh, I'm doing one in New Orleans in March that's open to the public. There will be elements of the there will be a Friday night lecture that I'm doing here in Chicago that's open to the public. I'm going to Santa Fe in April, and there there will be an element of that that's open to the public. Great. And that's usually the typical format is there's a Friday night presentation that I'll do that's open to the public. And then there's usually a workshop for analysts or analysts and candidates. And then usually something for just candidates in these, in these analytic institutes. So thank you so much for your time today, Thank Mark. you, Laura. It's been really enlightening and you've done a great job explaining to all of us things that um, are very important to this field, and I uh, really appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Laura. I really appreciate you inviting me, and I hope the podcast continues to grow and expand. Thank you. hope so, too. I really appreciated Dr. Winborn taking time out of his schedule to speak with me. You can visit his website, drmarkwinborn.com, for more information about his work. And please visit our website, speakingofjung.com, where you'll find links to the books and lectures that were mentioned today, as well as all the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to download for free. And you can also find this podcast on iTunes and on Stitcher. So with eternal gratitude to Hilton Hotels, Sean Lau, Charlie Arthur, and Diane Braden, this is Laura London, 
and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung. <laughs>